Good morning. Glad to have each and every one of you here this morning for our morning worship service in which we're going to take some time to look at the book of James. It's been a good study thus far. We've got the three or four more sermons in the book of James before we're done. And I'm not quite sure where we're going after that, but at the same time, it's a book that's been very, very practical because James really just centered on the practical. He ministered to the church as a whole, and it's uh, just a great opportunity to do that. It's been an eventful week, hasn't it? With the Supreme Court announcement that came on Thursday, and with all the things that have taken place since that time, it's just very amazing to see what has happened, and the sanctity of human life has been restored as far as the Constitution is de determined. We still have to say what the states will determine, but the states are the ones that will now determine exactly what the laws are considering uh, human life. And that's a really, really important thing. So we are thankful for their decision. At the same time, that doesn't mean you give up praying. That's not something to do ever. Because just as quickly as a decision can be made, it can be overturned. And we have to watch out for all the things that are going to take place. At the same time, if you know people who are on the other side, take an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Because, you know, really, when you get aligned with Christ, it changes the way you look at things and the way you take things and the way you actually perceive things. And hopefully you have the view of life. Do you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, even before I was born, determined every single thing that I would be born as? How tall I would be, what kind of shape I would have, uh, whether or not I would have hair or not, that type of thing. All of that was determined by the Lord even before I was born. And he is the one who has gone through all of that. He has understood exactly what my mental abilities and skills would be. And actually he has determined all the things that were about it. And he knew it before it actually began because he was in determining that before the foundations of time. And that is just a, a really precious thought in its own way. So uh, what would I say? Right now, our nation needs a lot of prayer. Your city needs a lot of prayer. People that are around you need you to be interceding for them before the throne of grace that God may minister to their need as well. And it's not that you have to have an argument. Arguments rarely solve anything. They usually build contentions. When you have a gentle discussion and center it upon what God says, that's a different matter. And sometimes you have to ask good questions rather than just make statements. Have you ever noticed that you can disarm somebody with a good question? I watched a professor at Talbot Theological Seminary a long time ago have a student that had the wrong opinion. Dr. Sosi began to ask him some questions. And he asked him question after question after question. And it was amazing, this student that was so certain he had the right viewpoint, every time the professor asked him a question, he took a step back. And he took a step back. And he took a step back. And finally, he found himself in the corner. And then the professor said, hmm, maybe you ought to think about that a little bit further. Didn't give him the solution, told him that he had to spend some time actually finding the solution. That's real wise counsel at the same time. A number of you have asked how my daughter Wendy is doing. She had her staples taken out this particular week, so she's got the uh, staples taken out of the brain surgery that she had. Uh, she's glad to have them out. They put her on a new medication. Hopefully that is going to give her some relief to where she can sleep better. Uh, she's also still going through that problem of aphasia. Hopefully in July they're going to be able to set up some speech therapy for her that will help her to find those words. You know, I just told her she's already got caught up with me because I mistake words all the time. You ever search for a word and can't find it? Well, that's what she's doing at the moment. Now, hers is because of brain surgery. Mine is just because I'm old. Uh, it's just that particular way. So please uh, continue to be in prayer for them. They're going to be seeing an oncologist soon, and at the same time, they'll be going through the process of having a second MRI, another MRI, to see how the uh, surgery is progressing and what is taking place. Uh, thank you all, again, for the many gifts that you have given. I've got a check in my pocket at the moment that will be sent to her soon that will help them as well during this time. You know, it's really, really difficult to know when she'll be able to go back to work or if she'll be able to go back to work. She's hoping so. She's planning on it. But at the same time, 
she's concerned about it because she doesn't think as straight as she used to. And uh, we have a shirt made up for her that says, I just had brain surgery, what's your excuse? Um, so hopefully that will, will be uh, a, a good thing for her. At the same time, there's people here that need our prayers and are going through times. They're going to have surgery in the near future. They're seeing the doctors at the moment. They're going through tests. You were asked to pray for that person down in Pleasanton that uh, had a, a fireman that lost his life in the uh, accident that took place on Main Street there. I know that they would appreciate your continued prayers for them. We also have a visitor here, Reverend Doctor. You know, I had somebody that wanted me to become a doctor one time. They wanted to be able to call me Reverend Doctor. I think that's a, a put those two titles together. It's rather strange. But Bill Fred Hendricks is with the Central Commission of the uh, uh, American Baptists in our district right here. He's involved with interim ministries all over the place. And as he said it, when he's not preaching, he likes to go to churches and to hear uh, other men preach and to share. That's a, a really good thing to do and to be involved with churches as well, and we're really glad to have him with us. He and I have been reminiscing about when we started. He started one year before I did, so he's got a year up on me. Uh, we'll have to go from there. So uh, we're glad to have him with us this morning and just to have the opportunity to share together. Before we do begin, let's just look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we come to you right now because you're a God of order, you're a God of love, you're a God of grace, a God of mercy. You, Father, because of your great desire to have, a, have fellowship with us, sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross for our sin, that although we were separated from you by sin, we could be reconciled by the blood that he shed there upon the cross. And by simply believing in him, we could come to know the blessing of eternal life. And we're thankful for that. We are thankful for the life that you have given to us. And ask God that you would help us to be wise to return to you the direction of our life and what we do. For Father, the wise man seeks the Lord. And a wise man does those things that he believes that the Lord wants him to do. And we pray, Lord, that we would be people just like that. We come to you today to pray for our nation as a whole. Father, the leaders need your direction. They need your guidance. We seem to be divided in our opinions over various things. And God, there seems to be no similitude of rightness amongst us. God, we pray that you would bring about order, that, God, you would bring about contentment, that, Father, you would help people to... Be willing to reach out and to minister to one another as you give them opportunity. We do pray for the Supreme Court and for the decision that they made. We at the same time pray for those who are of various opinions all over our nation that God, they will allow their discussions to handle things and not be violent in it. We pray for peace and order in our country. We pray too for direction amongst uh, all the people of our nation. How Father violence has consumed us, how we seem to use a gun with no concern whatsoever and take life as if it's nothing. And we would pray, God, that you would uh, help our nation to return to a semblance of peace. May we seek the Prince of Peace who brings about peace in our heart and our soul, and may that direct us. We come to you also, Lord, to pray that you would uh, continue to minister to those who are going through the pandemic at this particular moment. We're thankful for the opportunity to have vaccinations for more, but Lord, at the same time, it is our prayer that you would bring it to an end and that, Father, soon we would be able to return to normal living in every matter. Be with our people as we plan vacation Bible school and as we, Lord, seek an opportunity to minister to young children in our area. Give us wisdom as to how to plan that and how to get it done. At the same time, God, we would pray at the, the same time that you, God, would build our church as a whole. I pray, Father, for my brother's ministry that he has amongst the southern region of the American Baptist Church, that God, as he seeks to supply interim pastors for churches, that God, you would bless his ministry and cause it to flourish for you. And that, Lord, these churches would find men who can preach the word of God and share the word of God in fine order. 
Lord, we pray for our church as a whole. Father, there are many going through times of trial that need your touch. Minister to them. We pray, Father, that as they plan surgeries, that God, those would go well. We pray, Father, as they seek doctors to understand what's taking place in their life, that you would help them. We pray, Father, for our people as a whole, that, God, we would be bound together in love, that we would know you, love you, and follow you. Now, Father, as we turn to your word, as we open the book of James, we pray, Lord, that you would take these six verses and use them in our hearts and in our lives and cause us, God, to be given more to you. We thank you that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces even to the dividing of soul of the soul and the spirit, that it understands the thoughts and intents of our mind, and that, God, from your word, you can bring peace in our heart and direction as we ought to go. Help that to be the case today, and we'll praise you for it. In Christ's name, amen. Now, there's one thing in your bulletin that I tried to put in because uh, we live in Raymore. Of course, I'd be coming down twice a week at least to be with you. And on Tuesday, I planned to be here initially at 1030. Unfortunately, I found out after I told Julie that, that this week she happens to have a doctor's appointment on Monday with Dr. Lacaretti, her heart doctor. Now, that heart doctor is very hard to get in and see. And then he's slower than molasses when he actually has an appointment. Her appointment's at 9 o'clock. We might see him by 10, if we're lucky, because he spends quality time with his patients, and he just extends everybody's appointment behind that. So although it says I'll be here at 1030, it's going to be more like noontime before we actually get down here on Tuesday. So don't plan on being here Tuesday before noon. Uh, Hopefully that will change in weeks to come, but we'll have to see concerning that. So on Tuesday, I'll be here about noontime. On <clears throat> Thursday, I'll be here hopefully at 1030, providing the creek don't rise. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would please, and turn to James chapter 3, uh, James chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. Remember, the book of James is basically looking at Moving to maturity, being one that really helps us with the situation. And this week, we're going to be looking at a specific uh, sermon title that, the, that money can be a problem. Money can be a problem from James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And as is our practice, shall we stand together as we read the word of the Lord. James 5, 1 through 6. There we read. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborer who mows your field, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have led lives of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the days of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man he does not resist you. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. It's kind of interesting that uh, a number of people have had different comments concerning riches. We talk about money. We talk about wealth. There are uh, uh, conversations on radio just about every Saturday that money talks. Some of them are at the same time talking about how to accumulate money for your retirement and everything else. Warren Wiersbe talked about a comedian who talked about money. And he just simply says, if money talks, all it says to me is bye-bye. Because that seems to be what he is uh, thinking about it. Here we're going to take a look at something that takes place in James. And I didn't know this till just recently because it hasn't really become a part, but 
I found that there's a structure in scripture that you find oftentimes called the chiastic structure. Now, you probably are looking at me and say, what in the world is that? Well, this structure is something that allows for a subject to be delineated one right after another. Let's say you have four subjects. You go subject one, subject two, subject three, subject four. And after you get to that midway point, you start going backwards. So you cover subject four again, then subject three again, then subject two again, then subject one again. So it is actually a basis for repeating subjects that you have previously cut her. And that is really basically a Jewish custom because everything was taught line upon line, time upon time, repeated over and over and over again. You remember when you were in elementary school that you went over the multiplication tables not once, not twice, but you went over them every single day for a long period of time, and you had to repeat them. I had teachers who wanted to make sure that I understood what the, to, the verb to be was, you know, is, am, are, was, were, being, being, been, have, has, had, do, does, did, be, my, must, make, and could. It was just a simple repeating thing that you did all the time, but it told you how to remember all of the could uh, the, the verbs to be. It was just a simple process. So a chiastic structure is a very good thing. It allows subjects to be covered over and over again. James said that riches were a problem in the church. In chapter 2, he really covered that. Because he said based upon how much wealth a person had determined where he got to sit in the church. And that was a real problem because some of the people who were rich were taking other people in the church to court. And they were putting them in jail because of what they did. And he has already covered the problem that wealth presents. And the poor man, he got to sit in the back or in a corner or under somebody's step stool because he wasn't worthy of a good seat. Favoritism was oftentimes shown. It wasn't to be shown because we are all children of God. We are all people who are saved by grace. And we aren't to give the rich man favoritism. We aren't to show favoritism to him. We're actually to treat everyone the same. And the rich have a habit of taking advantage of their wealth against the poor. They have abilities that we don't have. And because of that ability, they oftentimes do wrong things. So James chapter 5 really talks about those subjects. What would I say the purpose of this sermon is today then? Today's sermon is that seeing that the love of riches and wealth are seen in Scripture as evil, and they are, what must believers guard themselves against, and how can we avoid judgment? Riches are a problem. What's the problem? 1 Timothy chapter 16, 6 and verse 16 says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not riches are evil. It's not wealth is evil. It's the love of it. It's desiring to love it above all things else and to put it first over God that becomes a problem. When we love wealth more than we love God, we have a problem. If you understand that wealth is just a tool and that that is to be used for God's glory, then it's a whole different matter. But here, when we see that we love riches, when we love wealth, when we love possessions, when we love things, we have a real problem in our life. And we happen to be a very materialistic nation. Face it. You know what a boat owner that just bought a 20-foot powerboat once? He wants a 22-foot one. You know what the person who has a, a nice sports car wants? He wants a Porsche. If he has a Porsche, he wants a Lamborghini. If he has a Lamborghini, he wants a race car. He wants to go up the scale. He wants to move up more and more and more. If you have a 40-foot boat, you want a larger yacht. We have a habit of always wanting more. If you're a golfer, you want the latest and greatest golf club, even though it won't cause you to really hit the ball any better than the other old one did. You basically have it where you have to, excuse the expression, those of you in the back, keep up with the Joneses. <laughs> the Joneses sit in the back. We always want to do what others do. We want to keep up. 
We don't want anyone to get ahead. We want to have the nicest car on the block. We want to have the best house on the block. We want to have the best things. So the scripture here is going to talk about all of the various problems that we have. And we're going to be looking at that today. So let's take a look at what our reaction should be according to verse 1. Verse 1 basically says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. James says it's so important that we need to pay really close attention to what our attitude is towards money. It's not just something to say, well, that's not me. I'm not going to pay any attention to it because it can manifest itself in many ways. Oh, yeah, it's not necessarily the dollars that are in the bank account. It can be the possessions that it buys because he's going to talk about those possessions in rather rich attitudes. He says it's important that we pay close attention to it and that we ought to weep and howl. The word weep there is the same word that is used when you have a death in a family. And it is a, a loud yell. It is a, a crying yell. It is something that goes way beyond just a simple tear. It is how bitter this is. If you took a look at some of those families that were in Uvalde just two, not too long ago, and you saw the anguish that they were in, you saw how it affected people. The man who lost his wife had a heart attack because of the grief that he was going through. He was absolutely devastated by what had taken place. Therefore, he weeped within his very heart to such an extent that it caused extreme grief. And you see oftentimes in depiction of what takes place in Israel, how the mourners just simply cry in anguish. But there's another word that's used there. That's the word howl. In English, we have a term for words that sound like the sound that they are supposed to make. They're automatic peo words. You know, the bells, the bells, the bells, where the sound of the word actually magnifies what it is. Here, the Greek word that is used is olo, olo, holo. And that particular word indicates the type of thing that's going on. You're weeping and you're howling within yourself. Kind of like the dog that when you have to make some music in front of him, he raises his head and he just howls. My wife and I were watching the Westminster Dog Show the other day on TV, and there happened to be an Alaskan Malamute. And that dog, all during, he was the first one judged, and every dog after that he howled for. So after 30 minutes of howling, he found out he lost. So basically what it amounted to is it was howling over and over and over again. The word here indicates that a rich person, rather than seeing himself as favored, rather than seeing himself as profitable, rather than seeing himself as being someone above everyone else, ought to realize that he's got a real problem within himself, and therefore he has to understand that he's in danger of real judgment, judgment that might come his way. Notice again the verse, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries coming upon you. So he adds that phrase that we weep like we lament at death. We howl because it intensifies the lamenting. And the judgments that we are facing are those that are going to come and they are going to be intense. Really intense. With the hurricanes that have been coming recently. Governors and states have been warning people it's time to get out and it's time to get out now because of what's coming. And when they hear that message, some respond real quickly and they leave. Others say, well, I've lived through them before, I'm going to live through them again. And then when the first responders have to go in and get them out, they said, I'll never do that again. The problem that we see is the rich people have, uh, don't understand that they're going to be judged for what God has granted them. When God has granted you a lot, he expects a lot. When God has given you little, he expects you to use the little correctly. You can be, what shall we call it, 
a person who shows the wrong attitude towards what little you have or towards what lot you have. It's not the amount that is the determiner, it's what you do with it and what your attitude is. So our reaction towards riches should not be that, man, now I'm free, I can do whatever I want, because that's not what's going to take place. Notice a second, that the evil depends upon hoarding riches. Look at verses 2 and 3. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded, and their corrosion will serve as a testimony against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is the last days that you have stored up treasure. Wow. You'll notice that it talks about hoarding here. What's a hoarder? It's a person who has more than he needs and just wants to keep it no matter what. We see sometimes the extremes on TV where somebody has a house and they can't even walk through the house because everything that they've ever had has to be kept and it not only has to be kept, it has to be out where they can see it all the time and sometimes it gets to such an extent that it causes things underneath them to rot and become a problem. What did you hoard in the day that we are talking about? You happen to hoard food and you happen to ha hoard other things. You see, in Jewish circles, food was really important. If you have 40 acres, you could have enough food on that 40 acres to last you for a whole year. If you happen to have a bumper crop, that meant you had more than enough for a long period of time. In Egypt, remember, when Joseph was under Pharaoh, he knew that there was seven years in which there was going to be great harvest, and they needed to collect it. Why? Because after the seven years of great harvest, there was going to be seven years of really severe famine, and there wasn't going to be enough food for the people of Egypt. So he collected 20% of the food in order to make sure that they had enough for the lean periods. So certain crops can be kept. Have you ever put anything in the refrigerator and forgotten about it? And when you finally open it, you see that green stuff on top of it that means that it's not edible anymore? Because it has turned. It is rotted. There is fungus growing from it. That loaf of bread that you had that was on the counter that you really didn't pay any attention for for over a week all of a sudden has mold on it and you know that that's not penicillin. So basically what it amounts to is you see the rotting that is taking place. You can have an awful lot of food and it doesn't do you any good because it rots. You have to take care of it. You have to make sure that it is correct. At the same time, the second thing that was really important to Jewish people were garments. Now most of us have rather large full closets and our clothes closet here is thankful that you do because you give away a lot of it too. However, in Jewish times, if you had two or three garments, you had a lot. Mary Jean and I at a national convention for the IFCA happened to go to Dolly Madison's house. She had a huge, huge, huge closet. That big by that deep. Enough for Two garments, maybe, maybe three. It was so small that you thought, that's the whole closet for the whole house? That was it. Because basically in those days, you had one set of clothes that you wore all this week and another set of clothes that you wore next week. And you washed them interchangeably. So you went down to wash them. If you were a real rich person, you had mini garments. And the mini garments were very special. However, there is a problem with having a lot of garments. They can become moth-eaten. You ever have something in your closet that uh, you forgot about for a long time and you happen to go back to it and say, oh, I remember this garment, and you take a look at it carefully, and because there wasn't the right type of uh, insecticide in the house or 
fragrance in the house. It became moth-eating. It's thin. It's not worthy to be kept. And all of a sudden, that which was so very, very special is no longer special. I've seen wedding dresses that were really white at one time that are very, very yellow, dinged, not proper because of what takes place. James here talks about the fact that they can have a lot of food and it's rotted. They can have at the same time a lot of garments and they are moth-eating. He then talks about gold and silver coins. Now, remember, we're not talking about gold itself and we're not talking about uh, silver itself. Those are precious metals. They will corrode a little bit. They don't rust. However, in coins, because there are other metals put in with them, those coins can rust and they can become a problem. So what he says is that they rust and they dissolve and they're not really worthy of anything. So let's look at two passages really quickly. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look at verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. Chapter 6, verse 17 reads, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things we enjoy. Don't depend upon the riches. Thank God for what he's given you that you can enjoy because he is the one that is supposed to be the one that we give the attitude to. Go back, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and look at verse 16. Luke 12, verse 16. And he told them a parable. The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began thinking to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This will I do. I will tear down my barns and will build larger one. And I will store all my grain and all my goods there. Notice what it says. And I will say to myself, you have goods stored up for many years to come. Relax, eat, drink, enjoy yourself. In other words, I've got everything I need. I can just relax, I can enjoy, I can do anything I want because I've got everything that I need. Verse 20 says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is demanded of you. As for you, all that you have prepared who will own it now? Such is the one who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich in his relation to God. We've had a number of very rich people in the world. Sam Walton, Walmart's owner, was very, very rich. He died of brain cancer. He was one who lost his life in a battle and all of the wealth that he had, all of the billions of dollars that were his, all of the stores that he owned and the possessions that he could have at all time weren't going to save his life. Fortunately, he was a believer. He is going to be in heaven. He is one who is dependent upon God, but his riches couldn't save him. God is the only one who can. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, Scripture says, and to lose his own soul? It doesn't do him any good whatsoever. All of the possessions you have doesn't make it right. So Scripture tells us, don't be rich just in things. Be rich in your relationship with God because that is the important thing. So when we hoard, it's evil. And by the way, you can hoard in a number of areas. It's possible to hoard just not in food, just not in, in, in clothes, just not in money. You can hoard with collections and other things. I've seen people that have so many possessions that it kind of makes ridiculous. I had one lady who I've never seen so many Christmas decorations as that in her house as ever. She had container after container after container and every year she had to take them out, dust them and put them back up on the shelf. 
and after Christmas she had to put them all away, and there was no more room for storage. It was just that large. Notice the third thing that we see, that their wealth could actually be unjustly acquired. Look, if you would, at uh, verse 4 and following. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mow your field and which have been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. How did the rich actually make their money? They made their money on the back of workers by the way that they paid them. You see, they weren't paying them as they were instructed to from the word of God. God literally told you in the Old Testament that you were to pay workers immediately. Every single day when they went out to the field, they made an agreement to you to work for a denarii, the, the wealth of one day's work. And after they worked the whole day, they were to get their denarii. If you were really a, a, a just person, you might pay them a little bit more. And there's even a parable concerning that. But you were to pay them immediately. And Leviticus tells us that specifically in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13. You know, it's interesting that John read from Leviticus this morning. We also can see it from there. That the, that the book of Leviticus gave us an instruction that you weren't to withhold money from them. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 through 19 basically gives you an instruction that you're to pay the person completely at that time. Here not to wait, you're to be dealing with him justly as a faithful laborer all the time. It is really important that you do so. And Jeremiah chapter 27 verse 13 gives the penalty for not doing that. A worker was important. There is the opinion sometimes against uh, or by owners that the worker isn't the important person. It's the boss. When the boss knows how to do things, everything goes well. However, I've never seen a boss necessarily able to do all the functions that a worker does. I can hire bricklayers, but I tell you what, if I have to lay bricks, I'm in trouble because I can't do it like they do. I tried in my own home to put in a sump pump one time with all the plastic piping that was up and found out that wasn't an easy function. I wound up having to call a pro to do it because he knew how to do it. In one hour, he was done with something that would have taken me hours to do. The worker was important. Paying him was also important. So he had to be paid immediately because the worker is important. Secondly, God knows what's happening. You'll notice here it says that you are to pay the laborer who mowed your field. Why? Because when you have withheld it, it cries out against you, and that outcry of those who are doing the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of armies. God knows the injustice. Please listen carefully. If you make a contract with somebody, fulfill it. If you promise to pay somebody for something, pay them what you agreed upon. Don't withhold it. Now, true, I understand that in building a house or something like that, you have methods in which you are supposed to do it. You pay them a certain amount beforehand so that they can get the supplies. You pay them during the course of their work so that they have money from which they are able to draw upon. And then you finish paying for them after the task is done. If you make a bad contract, whose fault is it? Well, Bob would have done that work for this amount of money. I, and the guy would probably look at you and say, well, you should have hired Bob. If you agreed to pay something, pay it, and don't have a problem with it. Make sure that you understand that you owe what God says. You'll notice it says that God is going to judge correctly. We sometimes judge incorrectly, don't we? I watched on TV the other day 
them pointing out that a certain umpire made the worst call you have ever seen because the ball was well below the knees and he called it a strike. I've seen umpires that when the ball was up here, call it a strike. The umpire makes a wrong decision. God knows when there's a wrong decision made. But God also knows when right decisions were made. There was a man that uh, I heard about in Michigan. He started an asphalt company. And during the course of making the asphalt company, he hired workers and kept them on. And as his business got stronger and stronger because of the quality of their work, they wound up with more and more pavers and more and more women that were doing the work. And by the time he had been in the business for 40, 50 years, he had a lot of equipment and he decided to retire and he sold his business. And all of the workers were kind of sad because they felt that they were going to lose their jobs. Except there was an envelope that he gave to each and every one of them. The envelope amazed some of them because although they had worked for him for 20, 30, 40 years, he gave them part of the profits that he gained from his business. He sold his business for $130 million. That was far more than he thought he ought to get for it. So basically, when somebody had worked for him 20 years, on top of the salary that he had given him, he gave him a bonus of $400,000. For some that had worked for him for 30 years, he gave them a million dollars because he felt that they earned part of the profit from what the business had grown to be. That man as a believer had a right attitude towards what money is. It's not to be hoarded. It's to be used to bring honor and glory to God. And his testimony is great. By the way, his workers really liked him. <laughs> Notice the final one. Their wealth was spent on self-indulgence. Verse 5. You have lived for pleasure on earth and have lived luxuriously. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Rich often have luxuries by their standards. You see, what is a normal luxurious thing becomes just a simple thing. So they have to have the very best. We've actually come to almost that attitude even amongst uh, lower quality people because basically if it doesn't have a designer name on it, it's not good enough anymore. We have to have the designer name. It has to be on just about everything that we have. So basically what it amounts to is for the rich, no want goes unmet. If you are an athlete who happens to earn millions and millions of dollars because you happen to have a skill in basketball or football or baseball, you can go any sporting event that you want. I'm not going to pay $7,000 to go to a Super Bowl. Even if it was given to me, I wouldn't want to go to a $7,000 event. That just seems ridiculous in its own regards. But no need for them goes unmet, and they meet it all the time. They believe that money can buy happiness and fulfillment. If you buy the large boat, what do you want? A larger boat. If you have the luxurious car, what do you want? Either more cars or greater ones. I heard of a man who recently bought a really nice car for his wife. It was a luxury vehicle, and four months later, he sold it to buy another one, exactly the same, except the color she wanted. It was the wrong color. And because of that, it wasn't good enough. It had to be the right way. And God said that the day of slaughter is coming against those people because they have fattened their hearts. We here know what it means to fatten up a calf in order to kill it, in order to provide for the table of somebody else. And you fatten them up at the end in order to have more meat. What basically amounts, though, here is that judgment is coming and they are fattening their desires because God is going to bring that judgment against them. And that judgment is going to be severe. They need to recognize that fact and change their ways. 
I have never seen anybody be satisfied with things. Solomon talked about the fact that he multiplied houses. He talked about the fact that he not only multiplied houses, he decorated them the way that he wanted to. He had everything just exactly as he desired. And you know what his observation is about those items in the book of Ecclesiastes? He says it's vanity. All is vanity under the sun. It doesn't satisfy whatsoever. Watch those who have extreme riches. Extreme riches wind up not satisfying, so what do they go to? Extreme immorality. And those who are most rich oftentimes are those with the worst possible moral character. Notice the final one that we have today. They have to maintain their lifestyle by killing. Look at verse 6. You have condemned and put to death the righteous person. He offered you no resistance. What it basically amounts to is he said that these people have gone even to another extreme. There's only one important person in their life and that is them. So if somebody else has something that they want, they're going to go against them. Therefore, they need to, the needs of others are so unimportant, they put them aside. My desires are best. Notice also that scripture says, they will even take advantage of those who don't resist them. And scripture says it goes even to the point of killing those that didn't resist them. I want your piece of property. Well, I've lived here all my life. I want to live here till the end. Well, you know, I, I need your property so I can build my building. I need your property so I can take care of this. I just want to live here through my lifetime. I've, I've earned the right to live here. And what takes place? They burn their property. They possibly kill the person that's within it. They take advantage of them in order to get what they want. That's not a very pleasant picture of a rich, a rich person, is it? When you take a look at those six things that we've looked at today, how they ought to weep and howl, how they have riches that are rotting for them, how they at the same time have not paid their laborers, how at the same time they have lived just in the luxury of the moment and all feeding their own desires and their own lusts. Scripture says that they have been condemned to condemning the righteous person to death. What's the application for today? Let me give you four things. First, God desires us to depend upon Him. Things and money are temporary. They provide no safety. If you were in the Ukraine when the Soviet Union attacked, you may have a bank account, you may have a lot of possessions, but after the war begins, what good are they? You can't take them with you. And they're going to be destroyed in those actions. If you happen to be in Yellowstone Park and happen to be in some of those homes that were there, including that big bunkhouse that went down the river, having a bunkhouse didn't provide for you. It's gone in just a second. Money and things do not provide safety. Only a relationship with God does. Emphasize what is important. Notice second, that wealth, possessions, and luxuries may be desirable, but have no power in themselves. Gaining the whole world, but losing your own soul is a heavy price because you're going to spend an eternity in the lake of fire, in hell. And by spending a lake of your eternity in hell, you have lost everything that is really important because your soul is the most important thing that you have. How do you relate to God? Third, cheating others to promote personal gain is against God's second command. First commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Him only shall you serve. The second commandment is like unto this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. So I have to love my neighbor as myself. I have to provide for him. And sometimes providing for him becomes more important than providing for myself. 
Love considers the best for each person loved. It's the selfless giving of yourself to the highest good of the person or the object love. And fourth, realize that loving God and my brother is the only way to true contentment. If you are a person that has to have possessions to be content, you're never going to get there. There's always another dollar to earn, another field to buy, another possession that needs to be owned, another thing that will hopefully take care of it, and no matter what you do, there's never enough. The only way that you have enough is by depending upon the Lord. Sola Scriptura says that the Bible is the only important thing. Sola Theo, God, is the important thing. May I suggest to you that rather than possessions, we need to emphasize in our life what is important. What's your relationship like with the Lord? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you come to a point where you understand how sinful you are and how great His mercy was towards you? And in understanding that, in your poverty for righteousness, you cling to Him to have the righteousness which He alone can give. And when you cling to Him for that righteousness, He gives to you the blessing of eternal life. There is nothing more valuable than that. As a sinner, as someone separated from the power of God by my own sin, the blood of Jesus Christ that saved me is the most valuable thing because it reconciled me to Him and He gives life forever. That is great. That is gracious. That is important. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for what your word says and for how it teaches us about the dangers of riches. Just as you showed in chapter 2, how favoritism comes to those who are rich and how they abuse the poor. Here, Father, you have shown that the wrong attitude of the heart causes us to be separated from you. We ought to howl in misery. We ought to be those who grieve within our very soul. We ought to recognize that possessions will never satisfy, that they become corrupt and dissolve. We ought to realize that we aren't to take advantage of others, that living in luxury is just ridiculous and it's of itself. And Father, that we need to consider how we can help our brother not destroy him. Lead us to that point, we pray. And God, may we as people really understand what is important. Your son did. He loved us so that he came to earth to be born of a virgin, to be born under the law, to redeem us. And we, Father, who are not worthy to be redeemed, have been bought back by you by his blood. And if we simply believe in you as our Lord and Savior, we can know the blessing of eternal life. Help us to understand just that. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen. Let's pray. Father, it's been good to be in your house. May we bind ourselves to you first. You've told us to love you. And the reason why we ought to love you is because you first loved us. You proved your love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, you sent Christ to die on the cross for our sins. You, Father, have perform the ministry of reconciliation to where if we simply call upon your name, if we simply believe in you, if we simply cry out to you, you will save us and bind us to you. And Father, because we have been bound to you, we can love one another more fully. Help us to do just that. Send us forth now with your blessing and your benediction upon us, and we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name, Amen.